became US president. And you can watch it on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. Well, earlier I spoke to the filmmaker James Fletcher. So when I saw you'd done this film, I thought to myself, well, do we not know why Donald Trump was elected in 2016? What new is there to say? And then I watched it and I realised that there was a hell of a lot new to say. How did you come up with the idea, first of all? Well, the thing was, because normally after a presidential election, there is a period of reflection when people try and understand what just happened. And that's gone on for a long time. And it's a regularly held process. And it's the same at home, of course. Um, but in the case of Trump, because he went into the presidency behaving the same as he did on the campaign. There was so much new material every day that there just wasn't this, the opportunity to look back. And so that's what gave me the, the idea to do the film. And we, we should explain to our listeners that you, you used to make films for David Cameron and Boris Johnson. You are British, but you now live in New York. Was it a challenge being a, a sort of Brit in America to really persuade people that you were the person to do this film? Well, to be honest, first of all, no one else was making it. And secondly, my, my pitch was always that I'm an outsider looking in and I'm trying to be objective about the whole process. I mean, as you know, in the 2016 election, it was a highly polarised set of circumstances. So to be able to say, obviously, as you know, from having seen the film, it's a balanced piece. So we, we approach Democrats and Republicans alike and they never really had to worry about what my agenda was because I don't have a vote. And as I say, I was trying to be objective. And you, you adopted quite an innovative approach to this because normally when you do a, a documentary, and we should say this is 106 minutes long, so it's quite in-depth, there's no narrator. And, yeah. and, and, you, and yet there is a narrative that runs throughout the whole thing, which maybe you only kind of realise towards the end of the film. But was that a deliberate technique? Honestly, it was. And, and part of the reason for not having a narrator is the minute you choose somebody, the first thing everyone does is Google their politics and what they're about. So if it's someone that's genuinely sym sympathetic to the Democrats, think, oh, OK, so this is a hit job on Trump. And likewise, you know, if I got John Voigt or Clint Eastwood or someone, you know, to, to do the voiceover from, from, from the right, they would have said, OK, this is just a pro-Trump film. And so by taking away the narrative, uh, the narrator, and, and therefore the, the, the inquiry about the background and the politics, you actually discharge all, all that from the start. And it makes it gives, I think, people a, a sense that we were trying to be fair about the whole film. Or you could just say, we couldn't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, you're absolutely right. <laughs> but so what, what you've got is a series, I mean, you use original footage quite a lot. Um, yes. You use um, interviews with part key participants. You've got Kellyanne Conway, people like that on. Um, and then Vox Pops from ordinary members of the public. Public. And that those three things meld together to provide the narrative, don't they? So that's absolutely right. And, and if, you know, and again, I, I credit our editor with a lot of this, but we basically had chapter headings of things we wanted to talk about, you know, the state of America, the media, the two candidates, uh, social media, huge part of this story, and on and on. And so we hung uh, various we basically treated it like like chapters and then sort of hung various ideas on, on the pegs of each of those chapters. And that's how we populated the film. But this is just as much about why Hillary Clinton lost as why Donald Trump won, isn't it? And I, I thought one of the most interesting techniques that you used, and I don't know whether this was deliberate or not, was that you, you were constantly playing out clips from um, panellists on like CNN or Fox from the time who were making all sorts of predictions about, well, Trump can't possibly win. Obviously, Hillary is going to win and it just showed up these kind of programs often for what they are I agree and I think there's no question the media and you know as well as I do the polling was absolutely in Hillary Clinton's favour through the whole process of the Republican primaries and obviously the Democrat primaries but then after Trump becomes nominated it's still called for Hillary Clinton which in my opinion meant the media was very lazy in its analysis because they didn't spend much time analysing Trump and, and really seeing what he was about. They saw him as good ratings, good television and therefore good income um, but they, did they really do their job in terms of scrutinising him as a candidate? I, I don't believe they did. I, I thought one of the light bulb moments in the whole film was when um, all of the different pundits that you had uh, as sort of talking heads were asked, what was the slogan that Donald Trump had on his baseball caps? Well, of course, we all know, make America great again. And then you asked, what was Hillary Clinton's campaign slogan? And I remember thinking to myself, I can't remember that, and nor could any of the pundits. 
And of course, if you can't remember, joking apart, you're someone very interested in politics who'd track this a lot more than most. But the, the fact of the matter is Hillary Clinton changed her slogan a number of times, which, you know, we all remember Obama's Yes, We Can. We all know that American Express don't, don't leave home without it. We know these very well-known slogans. And the point of the reason we know them is because they don't change and, and, and either candidates or, or corporations are very committed to what these, these slogans are, having thoughts about them. And the fact that Clinton chopped and changed Changed and, and all the senior Washington correspondents couldn't name uh, her, her slogan, including one who'd sat on the plane every day with the slogan written on the side, was all you needed to know. Uh, and also, they, they just didn't understand the mentality of Trump supporters or people who were likely to be Trump supporters. But this didn't start with Trump, did it? You can trace it back many, many years to the formation of the Tea Party. Sarah Palin, I suppose, was the um, personification of the first time that we, we really came across fake news, where she would say something and stand by it, even though everybody could see that it was just completely wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, what's interesting about Trump, sort of to this point, but to, to bring it back to the Trump era, was he was very good at giving a message to cert to voters who cared more about one issue than anything else. So whether or not they liked Trump didn't really matter because he had a message about the Supreme Court, he had a message about tax, he had a message about immigration, a message about pro-life. And so all kinds of people that normally would find him disgusting and not some somebody they'd want to vote for were persuaded because he had a message for a great number of voters on the one issue they cared about more than any other. I think one of the things that, um, I mean, when I wrote a review of your film, I said that there are going to be thousands of trees felled trying to explain the Trump phenomenon and why he won. Well, frankly, people just spent, need to spend 106 minutes watching your film because I think you explain it in a way that, that no book ever probably could. And it's available on Amazon Prime and Apple. And that this was your initiative. I mean, you haven't been funded by some big media conglomerate, even though it's something that if the BBC had made it, they would be really proud of it. Is this the future for documentary making, do you think? I think I think it is. I mean, the luxury we had is that we weren't answerable to some executive with, you know, with, you know, a short attention span making daft suggestions just for the sake of it. We, you know, we had a small group, the small group of us thought this through very carefully and made exactly the film we wanted to make. And we've released it, as you say, on Apple and Amazon. Um, Yes, I think it could well be because, you know, the cost of production has gone down, uh, as is the cost of distribution. We don't have to create tons of DVDs and send them around the world. Um, so, yeah, I think it could well be. And and the world is moving to a more streaming, you know, setup. If you, what's going on in America is just a little bit ahead of home. But, of course, the iPlayer blazed the way for digital distribution. Mm. Well, it, it's a great film and congratulations for making it. I think you, you've, it's kind of public service broadcasting, as it should be. Oh. James... James, thank you very much indeed. That's James Fletcher. His film is called The Accidental President and you can watch it on Amazon Prime and Apple TV and if you want to read my review of it, it's on iandale.com.